Good morning, everyone. My name is Evie Martin. I'm the lead pastor here at Flatwoods Church. I add my congrats to the graduates this morning. Um, I told, told one of our graduates over here, I've already cried three times today. I don't, I don't even have a graduate, but I love all of you. So, <laughs> And you all were sort of coming into high school as I arrived here at Flatwoods. So maybe you're like my first full high school class and college for those of you. So proud of you all. Congratulations. I grew up in the heart of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Our church was a half an hour away from our house, and we went to church twice on Sundays and almost every Wednesday night. So I logged um, thousands of Sunday miles in the backseat of the family minivan on Interstate 30. And halfway between home and church, right off the highway, was a building that looked like a palace from the movie Aladdin. This odd and even garish building, so out of place right off the North Texas freeway, far from any entertainment district, was Ripley's Believe It or Not and Palace of Wax. Anyone ever been to a Ripley's Believe It or Not? Some of you? <laughs> I haven't. Still drove by it, drove past it every Sunday, more times than I can count, and I've still never been to one. But it's a strange kind of place, yes? A place that appeals to your sense of incredulity. Things that shouldn't be, but are. The unusual, the odd, the almost impossible. It's a place that capitalizes on our sense of doubt and appeals to the common sentiment that we have to see it to believe it. Belief in our modern construct begs for evidence, for proof, for visual confirmation that a thing is real and true and therefore worthy of believing, particularly if it is strange. But this series over the last few weeks has attempted to expand our notion of belief to reclaim some of its more historic meaning, particularly because Christians are a people who talk a lot about belief. If you will, join with me in these words of belief passed down to us from the early church in the Apostles' Creed, if you'll join with me. We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Oh, we'll keep going, there we go. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the context of faith, we inherit the word believe as a heart word, not a head word. It has much more to do with trust and love than it does understanding. As Hebrews chapter 11 puts it, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. To believe in the Christian sense then is to set one's heart upon, to put one's heart upon the almost impossible, or as we have branded it in this series, to be love. As we've worked our way through the Apostles' Creed in this series, we have tried to shift our lens from thinking about the claims of the creed to trusting in them. To shift our language to be love requires us to have some stake in what we say. It requires not that we think differently, but that we live differently. Love is a relationship and it changes us. Creeds are Trinitarian in nature, so in weeks one and two, we covered the first two persons of the Trinity, God and then Jesus, and today the creed addresses the work of the Holy Spirit. As a kid, I always thought it was funny that God got some pretty grandiose and flowery language in the first part, and then the Jesus part is quite extensive, even adding in details about his mom and historical figures like Pontius Pilate, who my son thought for the longest time was the conscious Pilate, like as opposed to an unconscious Pilate. 
I could just have this picture of like all the conscious pilots around Jesus. I don't know, it's great. I think we fixed, fixed his understanding. But, and then after all of that, then we get to the Holy Spirit and it's like the creed writers didn't know what else to say. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Yep, that's about it, just the one line. And then we move on to this long laundry list of some other things that it seemed important to cram in. I understand it differently now, of course. I see that the spirit is the part that holds the whole thing together. And everything that comes after that line, we believe in the Holy Spirit, is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and how we experience the Spirit's presence in our lives. Today is Pentecost Sunday, the day that the church throughout the world celebrates what happened in Acts chapter 2. I'll read some of it for you. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Then after this happened, a whole bunch of other wild things started to happen. Peter started to preach. People could understand languages that they didn't know before. Massive crowds drew near. The disciples started baptizing people. And then after that, we see groups of new Christians beginning to form quickly and meet regularly as described at the end of the chapter, picking up in verse 42. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, to their prayers, a sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They praised God, demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. So Pentecost is the day we celebrate as the day the Holy Spirit birthed the church. So it starts to make sense then how all the rest of the creed falls into sync with what it is the Spirit is up to in and around us. But what exactly are we to make of this first simple line? We believe in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is mystery. The Spirit isn't limited to a story in Acts. The Spirit is in the Trinity and therefore is in all through all, with God in the beginning, with Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection. St. Hildegard of Bingen, a Benedictine abbess, as well as a writer, composer, mystic, and medical practitioner, a thousand years ago, describes the Spirit this way. The Holy Spirit is life-giving life, universal mover, and the root of all creation, refiner of all things from their dross, brings forgiveness of guilt and oil for our wounds, is radiance of life most worthy of worship, wakening and reawakening both earth and heaven. The spirit is ruach in Hebrew, which is breath or wind, elusive yet steady and ever-present, The Spirit is also Sophia in the Old Testament, which means wisdom. Both of these names for the Spirit are feminine nouns, so you will often hear me refer to the Holy Spirit as she. To beloved the Holy Spirit is to set our hearts upon the reality that from the beginning of time, she is in all things, around all things, animating all things, and weaving all things into the love of God. The Spirit is the web that holds all creation together from the beginning to the end, from the nearest molecules to the farthest black holes. And so the very next line of the creed starts to make more sense when we see them all through the lens of this connectedness that the Spirit weaves. We continue, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. This one has tripped a lot of people up over the years. Catholic? Wait, we're not, we're, we're not Catholic? What is this talking about here? The word isn't referring to what we might think of. Maybe you grew up in the Roman Catholic Church. You have family in the Roman Catholic Church. We're not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. 
You might think of that one as a Catholic with a capital C, a proper noun Catholic. But historically, the creed has been lowercase c Catholic. And Catholic comes from two words combined in Greek, kata and holy. Kata meaning throughout and holy meaning whole. So Catholic, as it is handed to us, means quite literally the church throughout the whole world. And the confusion around this word and the obstacle that it presents to newcomers is the reason many churches, us included, have moved toward an ecumenical version of this creed, which uses the word universal instead. That's what we said earlier. For us today, the word universal more clearly articulates the meaning of the church, people following Jesus in all places across all time. It is the church that the Spirit has breathed life into day after day, century after century, in every corner of the world, and we are all part of it. To say we belove this universal church means that we trust God's Spirit is up to something through it. That this massive web of people shaped by the love of God through Jesus Christ, in spite of everything that we've messed up, actually becomes a body that is animated by the Spirit to restore and to mend the world around it. To say we beloved it is to say we humbly take our place in a long and wide line of people who have been walking in the way of Jesus for nearly 2,000 years that the church is bigger than us. It's bigger than Platwood's church. It's bigger than the United Methodists. It's bigger than Protestant and Catholic. I experience this belief about the Holy Catholic Church most poignantly in our sacraments. When we come forward to Christ's table, every time we do it, my imagination leaps to other tables, to every table, everywhere that has ever come before and will ever come after. Every hand that has ever been outstretched, every mouth that has been fed by the bread of life. And in the same way, when I pour the waters of baptism and I pray for the Spirit's presence, the baby or the child or the student or adult whose head is washed with that water joins hosts of millions throughout the ages who are the Holy Catholic Church. The Spirit is the one who weaves us all together and moves us toward restoration. This is the holy universal church. We move to the next line, the communion of saints. If you'll notice, each line of this part of the creed starts to draw the circle a little bit smaller and a little bit closer. Some hear these words, communion of saints, and think more of that universal church that we just unpacked, all the faithful who have come before in all times and places. And it's perfectly fine to understand communion of saints in that same way. It aligns with that universal church idea. But the original Greek words of this creed read koinonia hagios, which means community of the holy. These were the words that described the small, local, gathered bodies of Jesus followers. So there's solid evidence that this phrase refers primarily to us, the the local church, the people we do faith with. It would make sense that we're moving down the funnel from spirit to universal church to local church. We beloved the communion of saints. We put our hope and trust, we set our hearts on our church. It matters to us that we have a group of people in this time, in this place in history, with whom we can work out our faith, who we can encourage, who can encourage us, who we can serve with and ask questions of, worship with, speak out for justice with, so our voice is not alone And this too is a place where God's spirit is present to us. We experience her nudge, her challenge, her prompting right here in this communion of saints. So to beloved the communion of saints is to have stake in whatever church we're in for however long we're in it, to live the mission, to act in it and for it, to show up, to lead, to serve, to love, to learn, or in some particular terms that we like to use a lot around here, to gather, to grow, to give, and to go. Together, we set our hearts upon the hope that the Spirit is doing something with us, 
for our world, and we become an active part. When I think of our graduates that we're celebrating today, I think about how these first two phrases can go with you. You've been connected to this little communion of saints here at Platwoods Church for months or years or maybe for your whole life. But because of the work of the Holy Spirit, as you go out into the wide world, wherever your path takes you, you are part of a much bigger whole. Our communion table here connects you to a communion table wherever you land. Your baptism links you to faithful people the world over. So as you step out in life and in your faith, you are never alone. You are a part of an incredible spirit-woven web. Be sure to find your new place in it, your communion of saints to walk alongside you. I hope that the stitches and the threads of these blankets you receive bring you back to the truth of your connectedness time and time again. Beloved the Holy Spirit in your life. The next line the creed gives us is the forgiveness of sins. And here we take one more step closer in. Forgiveness is experienced personally between people, most often in the context of that koinonia, the community. Committing our hearts to a community of imperfect people is the best way for us to recognize our own need for forgiveness. Collectively, all of us from God, but also individually from one another. If you've ever been forgiven for anything, big or small, if you reflect upon that experience, you know that it's an experience that surpasses words. It hits you right in your spirit because it is the work of the Holy Spirit. This mending and restoring between people who hurt and who have hurt. And when we have an experience of the holy like that, it changes us. It frees us from baggage, from shame, from regret, and it turns us into new people. Forgiven people start to live as forgiving people. And so to beloved the forgiveness of sins is to be convinced and convicted that a church full of people that have learned how to give and receive forgiveness is a church that is serious about transforming the world and the way we live in it. And then we come to the resurrection of the body. We believe in the resurrection of the body. That sentence alone could be an entire sermon. In fact, I've preached it before (laughs) in 2021 in a series we called Embody. So if you want a deeper dive into the topic of our resurrected bodies, check out our sermon archives. But the bottom line is Christians set our hearts upon a future beyond our death that is embodied. We don't always act like we believe that. Christians sometimes talk about our bodies as our physical shell or death as a spiritual release from the prison of our bodies. Maybe you've heard language like that before. But those kinds of sentiments don't line up with what we say we believe. We believe that we will live in bodies again. We don't know exactly what that was going to be like. Only one body has been resurrected in this way before, and that was Jesus. Since none of us were around to see him then, we have to trust the stories that are handed to us. His body was recognizable, but different. He could eat and touch and be touched. He showed up in places he hadn't been a moment before. He was wounded, but his wounds were healed. A resurrected body is a different body, but it is a body. From Philippians chapter three, Our citizenship is in heaven. We look forward to a savior that comes from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform our humble bodies so that they are like his glorious body by the power that also makes him able to subject all things to himself. The resurrection of Christ is our resurrection. And for all the things that we can't answer about our resurrected bodies, like will it be my 14-year-old body or my 82-year-old one? Will I have hair again? Will I still need glasses? Could I be just two inches taller? Could I not be tone deaf? Will my wounds and scars still be there like Jesus? 
For all those things we can't know, what we can say with certainty is that when Jesus raises us up, we will have bodies. They will not be subject to pain and decay. They will be reclaimed and recreated in God's goodness. The spirit who scooped up stardust and dirt, sculpted our bodies and breathed into them life the first time, can take all that is left at the end, the dust to which we return, and do so again in a new creation and will. Which leads us finally to the life everlasting. Our creed ends with this conviction that the Spirit's eternal work in us is to bring about a fullness of life that extends beyond the decades we have of this life as we know it. We can only grasp at ideas and catch glimpses of what that everlasting life might be. This is Ripley's Believe It or Not, again, asking to embrace what we cannot comprehend. But we draw competing notions from scripture about when and how we will enter into that fullness of presence with God. Reverend Dr. Tom Long, who's a theologian and a great author, um, most importantly, he was my preaching professor, uh, but he invites us into the tension that scripture gives us about what this life everlasting will be and when it will come about. I'll read from some of his book. There are two images in the New Testament about what happens. First, the resurrection day, when the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised up incorruptible. If you had only that image, what we would imagine is that when people die, they lie in some intermediate state, awaiting the great resurrection day. The other image, however, is that death contains no victory over us at all. As soon as we die, we are with God. We get this in the book of Revelation, where John looks up and already the saints who have died are praising God around the throne. In terms of linear time, We can't work this out. We've got these two competing images. You either wait until the general resurrection or you go immediately to be with God. But the imposition of linear time on what is an eternal idea is what creates the contradiction. I don't try to make a theologian out of Einstein, but he did show us that events that happen in sequence can also be events that happen simultaneously. If Einstein can imagine that in terms of physics, theologians can imagine it also in terms of the intrusion of eternity into linear time, that we are both immediately raised and raised together. How's that to make your brain hurt here at the end? (laughs) But haven't I said all along that to believe has very little to do with your head None of these claims demand that you understand them. They ask that you trust them. They ask that you set your heart upon them and then live like they matter. To belove the Holy Spirit who birthed and weaves together the holy universal church is to live knowing you are an integral part of a vast and diverse and beautiful web of the love of God across time and space. To be love the Holy Spirit who animates the communion of saints into action in the world is to love your church and to be your church and to lean into the work and the people God has put you with for this season. To be love the Holy Spirit who binds up brokenness with forgiveness is to be tender-hearted, as your own humble heart receives grace from God and from others and then generously forgives in return. To be love the Holy Spirit who resurrects our bodies and breathes the breath of life everlasting into those new lungs is to live amidst the hopelessness and suffering of this world, clinging to a radical hope that the fullness of life God made us for is something we can and will all know. What we believe doesn't mean a thing to us or to anyone else if it's all in our head and never reaches our hearts. But who we beloved is who we will follow and where we will set our hearts. And when our hearts are set, our lives change. What we hope for, we will have eyes to see. Will you join me once again as we set our hearts upon this affirmation? 
of our faith. We beloved God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We beloved Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. We beloved the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.